Chapter One of Nutcracker and Mouse King. Recording by Sandra Cullen. Christmas Eve. During the long, long day of the 24th of December, the children of Dr. Stahlbaum were not permitted to enter the parlour, much less the adjoining drawing room. Frederick and Maria sat nestled together in a corner of the back chamber. Dusky twilight had come on, and they felt quite gloomy and fearful, for, as was commonly the case on this day, no light was brought into them. Fred, in great secrecy and in a whisper, informed his little sister, she was only just seven years old, that ever since morning he had heard a rustling and a rattling, and now and then a gentle knocking in the forbidden chambers. Not long ago, also, he had seen a little dark man, with a large chest under his arm, gliding softly through the entry, but he knew very well that it was nobody but Godfather Drosselmeyer. Upon this, Maria clapped her little hands together for joy, and exclaimed, Ah, oh, what beautiful things has Godfather Drosselmeyer made up for us this time! Councillor Drosselmeyer was not a very handsome man. He was small and thin, had many wrinkles in his face. Over his right eye he had a large black patch. And he was without hair, for which reason he wore a very nice white wig. This was made of glass, however, and was a very ingenious piece of work. The godfather himself was very ingenious also. He understood all about clocks and watches, and could even make them. Accordingly, when any one of the beautiful clocks in Dr. Stahlbaum's house was sick and could not sing, Godfather Drosselmeyer would have to attend to it. He would then take off his glass wig, pull off his brown coat, put on a blue apron and pierce the clock with sharp-pointed instruments which usually caused little Maria a great deal of anxiety. But it did the clock no harm. On the contrary, it became quite lively again, and began at once right merrily to rattle, and to strike and to sing, so that it was a pleasure to all who heard it. Whenever he came, he always brought something pretty in his pocket for the children, sometimes a little man who moved his eyes and made a bow, at others, a box, from which a little bird hopped out when it was opened. Sometimes one thing, sometimes another. When Christmas Eve came, he had always a beautiful piece of work prepared for them, which had cost him a great deal of trouble, and on this account it was always carefully preserved by their parents, after he had given it to them. Ah, what beautiful present has Godfather Drosselmeyer made for us this time, exclaimed Maria. It was Fred's opinion that this time it could be nothing else than a castle in which all kinds of fine soldiers marched up and down and went through their exercises. Then other soldiers would come and try and break into the castle. But the soldiers within would fire off their cannon very bravely, until all roared and cracked again. No, no, cried Maria, interrupting him. Godfather Drosselmeyer has told me of a lovely garden where there is a great lake upon which beautiful swans swim about with golden collars around their necks and sing their sweetest songs. Then there comes a little girl out of the garden down along the lake and coaxes the swans to the shore and feeds them with sweet cake. Swans never eat cake, interrupted Fred somewhat roughly, and even Godfather Drosselmeyer himself can't make a whole garden. After all, we have little good of his playthings. They are all taken right away from us again. I like what Papa and Mama give us so much better, for we can keep their presents for ourselves and do as we please with them. The children now began once more to guess what it could be this time. Maria thought that Miss Truncheon, her great doll, was growing very old, for she fell almost every moment upon the floor, and more awkwardly than ever. 
which could not happen without leaving sad marks upon her face. And as to neatness in dress, this was now altogether out of the question with her. Scolding did not help the matter in the least. Frederick declared, on the other hand, that a bay horse was wanting in his stable, and his troops were very deficient in cavalry, as his papa very well knew. By this time it had become quite dark. Frederick and Maria sat close together, and did not venture again to speak a word. It seemed now as if soft wings rustled around them, and very distant but sweet music was heard at intervals. At this moment a shrill sound broke upon their ears. Kling, ling, kling, ling! The doors flew wide open, and such a dazzling light broke out from the great chamber, that with the loud exclamation, Aha! the children stood fixed at the threshold. But Papa and Mama stepped to the door, took them by the hand and said, Come, come, dear children, and see what Christmas has brought you this year. End of chapter one. The Gifts Kind reader or listener, whatever may be your name, whether Frank, Robert, Henry, Anna or Maria, I beg you to call to mind the table covered with your last Christmas gifts, as in their newest gloss they first appear to your delighted vision. You will then be able to imagine the astonishment of the children as they stood with sparkling eyes, unable to utter a word for joy at the sight before them. At last Maria called out with a deep sigh, Ah! Oh, how beautiful! Ah, how beautiful! And Frederick gave two or three leaps in the air, higher than he had ever done before. The children must have been very obedient and good children during the past year, for never on any Christmas Eve before had so many beautiful things been given to them. A tall fir tree stood in the middle of the room, covered with gold and silver apples, while sugar almonds, comfits, lemon drops, and every kind of confectionery hung like buds and blossoms upon all its branches. But the greatest beauty about this wonderful tree was the many little lights that sparkled amid its dark boughs, which like stars illuminated its treasures, or like friendly eyes seemed to invite the children to partake of its blossoms and fruit. The table under the tree shone and flushed with a thousand different colours. Ah, oh, what beautiful things were there! Who can describe them? Maria spied the prettiest dolls, a tea set, all kinds of nice little furniture, and what eclipsed all the rest, a silk dress, tastefully ornamented with gay ribbons, which hung upon a frame before her eyes, so that she could view it on every side. This she did too, and exclaimed over and over again, Ah, the sweet, ah, the dear, dear frock, and may I put it on? Yes, yes, may I really, though, wear it? In the meanwhile, Fred had been galloping round and round the room, trying his new bay horse, which, true enough, he had found fastened by its bridle to the table. Dismounting again, he said it was a wild creature, but that was nothing. He would soon break him. He then reviewed his new regiment of hussars, who were very elegantly arrayed in red and gold, and carried silver weapons and rode upon such bright shining horses, that you would almost believe these were of pure silver also. The children had now become somewhat more composed and turned to the picture books, which lay open on the table, where all kinds of beautiful flowers and gaily dressed people and boys and girls at play were painted as natural as if they were alive. Yes, the children had just turned to these singular books, when, 
Cling, ling, cling, ling. The bell was heard again. They knew that Godfather Drosselmeyer was now about to display his Christmas gift and ran towards a table that stood against the wall, covered by a curtain reaching from the ceiling to the floor. The curtain behind which he had remained so long concealed was quickly drawn aside and what saw the children then? Upon a green meadow, spangled with flowers, stood a noble castle with clear glass windows and golden turrets. A musical clock began to play when the doors and windows flew open and little men and women with feathers in their hats and long flowing trains were seen sauntering about in the rooms. In the middle hall, which seemed as if it were all on fire, so many little tapers were burning in silver chandeliers, there were children in white frocks and green jackets dancing to the sound of the music. A man in an emerald green cloak at intervals put his head out of the window, nodded, and then disappeared. And Godfather Drosselmeyer himself, only that he wasn't much bigger than Papa's thumb, came now and then to the door of the castle, looked about him, and then went in again. Fred, with his arms resting upon the table, gazed at the beautiful castle and the little walking and dancing figures and then said, Godfather Drosselmeyer, let me go into your castle. The counsellor gave him to understand that that could not be done, and he was right, for it was foolish in Fred to wish to go into a castle, which with all its golden turrets was not as high as his head. Fred saw that, likewise himself. After a while, as the men and women kept walking back and forth, and the children danced, and the emerald man looked out at his window, and Godfather Drosselmeyer came to the door, and all without the least change, Fred called out impatiently, Godfather Drosselmeyer, come out this time at the other door. That can never be, dear Fred, said the counsellor. Well then, continued Fred, let the green man who peeps out at the window walk about with the rest. And that can never be, rejoined the counsellor. Then the children must come down, cried Fred. I want to see them nearer. All that can never be, I say, replied the counsellor a little out of humour. As the mechanism is made, so it must remain. So, cried Fred in a drawling tone, all that can never be. Listen, Godfather Drosselmeyer, if your little dressed up figures in the castle there can do nothing else but always the same thing, they are not good for much and I care very little about them. No, give me my hussars, who can manoeuvre backward and forward as I order them and are not shut up in a house. With this he darted towards a large table, drew up his regiment upon their silver horses, and let them trot and gallop and cut and slash, to his heart's content. Maria also had softly stolen away, for she too was soon tired of the sauntering and dancing puppets in the castle. But as she was very amiable and good, she did not wish it to be observed so plainly in her as it was in her brother Fred. Councillor Drosselmeyer turned to the parents and said, somewhat angrily, An ingenious work like this was not made for stupid children. I will put up my castle again and carry it home. But their mother now stepped forward and desired to see the secret mechanism and curious works by which the little figures were set in motion. The councillor took it all apart and then put it together again. While he was employed in this manner, he became good-natured once more and gave the children some nice brown men and women with gilt faces, hands and feet. They were all made of sweet thorn and smelt like gingerbread, at which Frederick and Maria were greatly delighted. At her mother's request, the elder sister Louise had put on the new dress which had been given to her 
and she looked most charmingly in it. But Maria, when it came to her turn, thought she would like to look at hers a while longer as it hung. This was readily permitted. End of chapter 2 The Favourite The truth is, Maria was unwilling to leave the table then, because she had discovered something upon it which no one had yet remarked. By the marching out of Fred's hussars, who had been drawn up close to the tree, a curious little man came into view, who stood there silent and retired, as if he were waiting quietly for his turn to be noticed. It must be confessed, a great deal could not be said in favour of the beauty of his figure, for not only was his rather broad, stout body, out of all proportion to the little slim legs that carried it, but his head was by far too large for either. A genteel dress went a great way to compensate for these defects, and led to the belief that he must be a man of taste and good breeding. He wore a hussar's jacket of beautiful bright violet, fastened together with white loops and buttons, pantaloons of exactly the same colour, and the neatest boots that ever graced the foot of a student or an officer. They fitted as tight to his little legs as if they were painted upon them. It was laughable to see that in addition to this handsome apparel, he had hung upon his back a narrow clumsy cloak that looked as if it were made of wood and upon his head he wore a woodsman's cap. But Maria remembered that Godfather Drosselmeyer wore an old shabby cloak and an ugly cap and still he was a dear, dear Godfather. Maria could not help thinking also that even if Godfather Drosselmeyer were in other respects as well dressed as this little fellow, yet after all he would not look half so handsome as he. The longer Maria gazed upon the little man, whom she had taken a liking to at first sight, the more she was sensible how much good nature and friendliness was expressed in his features. Nothing but kindness and benevolence shone in his clear, green, though somewhat too prominent eyes. It was very becoming to the man that he wore about his chin a nicely trimmed beard of white cotton, for by this the sweet smile upon his deep red lips was rendered much more striking. Ah, dear father, exclaimed Maria at last, to whom belongs that charming little man by the tree there? He shall work industriously for you all, dear child, said her father. He can crack the hardest nuts with his teeth, and he belongs as well to Louise as to you and Fred. With these words her father took him carefully from the table, and raised up his wooden cloak, whereupon the little man stretched his mouth wide open and showed two rows of very white, sharp teeth. At her father's bidding, Maria put in a nut, and crack! The man had bitten it in two, so that the shell fell off, and Maria caught the sweet kernel in her hand. Maria and the other two children were now informed that this dainty little man came of the family of nutcrackers, and practised the profession of his forefathers. Maria was overjoyed at what she heard, and her father said, Dear Maria, since friend Nutcracker is so great a favourite with you, I place him under your particular care and keeping. Although, as I said before, Louise and Fred shall have as much right to his services as you. Maria took him immediately in her arms and set him to cracking nuts. But she picked out the smallest that the little fellow need not stretch his mouth open so wide, which in truth was not very becoming to him. Louise sat down by her, and friend Nutcracker must perform the same service for her too, which he seemed to do quite willingly, for he kept smiling all the while very pleasantly. In the meantime, Fred had become tired of riding and parading his hussars, and when he heard the nuts crack so merrily, 
he ran to his sister and laughed very heartily at the droll little man who now since fred must have a share in the sport passed from hand to hand and thus there was no end to his labour fred always chose the biggest and hardest nuts when all at once crack crack it went and three teeth fell out of nutcracker's mouth and his whole under jaw became loose and rickety ah oh, my poor dear nutcracker said maria and snatched him out of fred's hands that's a stupid fellow said fred he wants to be a nutcracker and has poor teeth he don't understand his trade give him to me maria he shall crack nuts for me if he loses all his teeth and his whole chin into the bargain why make such a fuss about such a fellow no no exclaimed maria weeping you shall not have my dear nutcracker see how sorrowfully he looks at me and shows me his poor mouth but you are a hard-hearted fellow you beat your horses yes and lately you had one of your soldiers shot through the head that's all right said fred though you don't understand it but nutcracker belongs as much to me as to you so let me have him maria began to cry bitterly and rolled up the sick nutcracker as quickly as she could in her little pocket handkerchief their parents now came up with godfather drosselmeyer the latter to maria's great distress took fred's part but their father said i have placed nutcracker expressly under maria's protection and as i see that he is now greatly in need of it i give her full authority over him and no one must dispute it besides i wonder at fred that he should require farther duty from one who has been maimed in the service as a good soldier he ought to know that the wounded are not expected to take their place in the ranks fred was much ashamed and without troubling himself further about nuts or nutcracker stole around to the opposite end of the table where his hussars after stationing suitable outposts had encamped for the night maria collected together nutcracker's lost teeth tied up his wounded chin with a nice white ribbon which she had taken from her dress and then wrapped up the little fellow more carefully than ever in her handkerchief for he looked very pale and frightened thus she held him rocking him in her arms like a little child while she looked over the beautiful pictures of the new picture book which she found among her other christmas gifts contrary to her usual disposition she showed some ill temper towards father drosselmeyer who kept continually laughing at her and asked again and again how it was that she liked to caress such an ugly little fellow that singular comparison with drosselmeyer which she made when her eyes first fell upon nutcracker now came again into her mind and she said very seriously who knows dear godfather if you were dressed like my sweet nutcracker and had on such bright little boots who knows but you would then be as handsome as he is maria could not tell why her parents laughed so loudly at this and why the counsellor's face turned so red and he for his part did not laugh half so heartily this time as he had done more than once before it is likely there was some particular reason for it end of chapter three chapter four of nutcracker and mouse king wonders upon wonders in the sitting-room of the doctor's house just as you enter the room there stands on the left hand close against the wall a high glass case in which the children preserve all the beautiful things which are given to them every year louise was quite a little girl when her father had the case made by a skilful joiner who set in it such large clear panes of glass and arranged all the parts so well together that everything looked much brighter and handsomer when on its shelves than when it was held in the hands on the upper shelf which maria and fred were unable to reach stood all godfather drosselmeyer's curious machines immediately below this was a shelf for the picture books 
The two lower shelves Maria and Fred filled up as they pleased, but it always happened that Maria used the lower one as a house for her dolls, while Fred, on the contrary, cantoned his troops in the one above. And so it happened today, for while Fred set his hussars in order above, Maria, having laid Miss Truncheon aside, and having installed the new and sweetly dressed doll in her best furnished chamber below, had invited herself to tea with her. I have said that the chamber was well furnished, and it is true. Here was a nice chintz sofa and several tiny chairs. There stood a tea table, but above all there was a clean white little bed for her doll to repose upon. All these things were arranged in one corner of the glass case, the side of which were hung with gay pictures, and it will readily be supposed that in such a chamber the new doll, Miss Clara, must have found herself very comfortable. It was now late in the evening, and night indeed was close at hand, and Godfather Drosselmeyer had long since gone home, yet still the children could not leave the glass case, although their mother repeatedly told them that it was high time to go to bed. It is true, cried Fred at last, those poor fellows, meaning his hussars, would like to get a little rest, and as long as I am here, not one of them will dare to nod. I know that. With these words he went up to bed, but Maria begged very hard. Only leave me here a little while, dear mother. I have two or three things to attend to, and when they are done I will go immediately to bed. Maria was a very good and sensible child, and therefore her mother could leave her alone with her playthings without anxiety. But for fear she might become so much interested in her new doll and other presents as to forget the lights which burned around the glass case, her mother blew them all out and left only the lamp which hung down from the ceiling in the middle of the chamber and which diffused a soft, pleasant light. Come in soon, dear Maria, or you will not be up in time tomorrow morning, called her mother as she went up to bed. There was something Maria had at heart to do, which she had not told her mother, though she knew not the reason why, and as soon as she found herself alone, she went quickly about it. She still carried in her arms the wounded nutcracker rolled up in her pocket handkerchief. Now she laid him carefully upon the table, unrolled the handkerchief softly and examined his wound. Nutcracker was very pale, but still he smiled so kindly and sorrowfully that it went straight to Maria's heart. Ah, oh, Nutcracker, Nutcracker, do not be angry at Brother Fred because he hurt you so. He did not mean to be so rough. It is the wild soldier's life with his hussars that has made him a little hard-hearted. But otherwise, he is a good fellow, I can assure you. Now I will tend you very carefully until you are well and merry again. As to fastening in your teeth and setting your shoulders, that godfather Drosselmeyer must do. He understands such things. But Maria was hardly able to finish the sentence, for as she mentioned the name of Drosselmeyer, friend Nutcracker made a terrible wry face, and there darted something out of his eyes like green sparkling flashes. Maria was just going to fall into a dreadful fright when, behold, it was the sad, smiling face of the honest nutcracker again, which she saw before her, and she knew now that it must be the glare of the lamp, which, stirred by the draught, had flared up and distorted nutcracker's features so strangely. Am I not a foolish girl, she said, to be so easily frightened, and to think that a wooden puppet could make faces at me? But I love Nutcracker too well, because he is so droll and so good-tempered, therefore he shall be taken good care of as he deserves. With this Maria took friend Nutcracker in her arms, walked to the glass case, stooped down and said to her new doll, Pray, Miss Clara, be so good as to give up your bed to the sick and wounded nutcracker, and make out as well as you can with the sofa. 
Remember that you are well and hearty, or you would not have such fat red cheeks and very little dolls have such nice sofas. Miss Clara, in her gay Christmas attire, looked very grand and haughty and would not even say muck. But why should I stand upon ceremony, said Maria, and she took out the bed, laid little Nutcracker down upon it softly, and gently rolled a nice ribbon which she wore around her waist, about his poor shoulders, and then drew the bedclothes over him snugly, so that there was nothing to be seen of him below the nose. He shan't stay with the naughty Clara, she said, and raised the bed with Nutcracker in it, to the shelf above, and placed it close by the pretty village, where Fred's hussars were quartered. She locked the case, and was about to go up to bed when, listen, children, when softly, softly it began to rustle, and to whisper, and to rattle round and round under the hearth, behind the chairs, behind the cupboards and glass case. The great clock whirred louder and louder, but it could not strike. Maria turned towards it, and there the large gilt owl that sat on the top had dropped down its wings so that they covered the whole face, and it stretched out its ugly head with the short, crooked beak and looked just like a cat. And the clock whirred louder in plain words. Dickery, dickery, dock, whirr, softly, clock. Mouse King has a fine ear. Prr, prr, pum, pum, the old song let him hear. Prr, prr, pum, pum, or he might run away in a fright. Now clock strikes softly and light. And pum, pum, it went with a dull, deadened sound, twelve times. Maria began now to tremble with fear, and she was upon the point of running out of the room in terror, when she beheld Godfather Drosselmeyer, who sat in the owl's place on the top of the clock, and had hung down the skirts of his brown coat, just like wings. But she took courage and cried out loudly with sobs. Godfather Drosselmeyer, Godfather Drosselmeyer, what are you doing up there? Come down and do not frighten me so, you naughty Godfather Drosselmeyer. Just then a wild squeaking and whimpering broke out on all sides. And then there was a running, trotting and galloping behind the walls, as if a thousand little feet were in motion and a thousand little lights flashed out of the crevices in the floor. But they were not lights. No, they were sparkling little eyes, and Maria perceived that mice were all around, peeping out and working their way into the room. Presently it went trot, trot, hop, hop about the chamber, and more and more mice in greater or smaller parties galloped across and at last placed themselves in line and column, just as Fred was accustomed to place his soldiers when they went to battle. This, Maria thought, was very droll, and as she had not that aversion to mice which most children have, her terror was gradually leaving her, when all at once there arose a squeaking, so terrible and piercing that it seemed as if ice-cold water was poured down her back. Ah, what now did she see? I know, my worthy reader, Frederick, that thy heart, like that of the wise and brave soldier, Frederick Stalbaum, sits in the right place. But if thou had seen what Maria now beheld, thou would certainly have run away. Yes, I believe that thou wouldst have jumped as quickly as possible into bed, and then have drawn the covering over thine ears much farther than was necessary to keep thee warm. Alas, 
Poor Maria could not do that now, for, listen, children, close before her feet there burst out sand and lime and crumbled wall stones, as if thrown up by some subterranean force, and seven mice heads with seven sparkling crowns rose out of the floor, squeaking and squealing terribly. Presently the mouse's body to which these seven heads belonged worked its way out, and the great mouse crowned with the seven diadems, squeaking loudly, huzzaed in full chorus as he advanced to meet his army, which at once set itself in motion, and hot, hot, trot, trot it went. Alas, straight towards the glass case, straight towards poor Maria, who stood close before it, her heart had before beat so terribly from anxiety and fear that she thought it would leap out of her bosom, and then she knew she must die. But now it seemed as if the blood stood still in her veins. Half fainting, she tottered backward, when clatter, clatter, rattle, rattle it went, and a glass pane, which she had struck with her elbow, fell in pieces at her feet. She felt at the moment a sharp pain in her left arm, but her heart all at once became much lighter. She heard no more squeaking and squealing, all had become still. And although she did not dare to look, yet she believed that the mice, frightened by the clatter of the broken glass, had retreated into their holes. But what was that again? Close behind her in the glass case, a strange bustling and rustling began, and little fine voices were heard. Up, up, awake, arms take, awake, to the fight, this night, up, up, to the fight. And all the while something rang out clear and sweet, like bells. Ah, that is my dear musical clock, exclaimed Maria joyfully, and turned quickly to look. She then saw how it flashed and lightened strangely in the glass case, and there was a great stir and bustle upon the shelves. Many little figures crossed up and down by each other, and worked and stretched out their arms as if they were making ready. And now Nutcracker raised himself all of a sudden, threw the bedclothes clear off, and leaped with both feet at once out of bed, crying aloud. Crack, 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 stupid pack, drive mouse back, stupid pack, crack, crack, mouse back, quick, crack, stupid pack. With these words he drew his little sword, flourished it in the air, and exclaimed, My loving vassals, friends and brothers, Will you stand by me in the hard fight? Straightway three scaramouches, a harlequin, four chimney sweepers, two guitar players and a drummer cried out, Yes, my lord, we will follow you with fidelity and courage. We will march with you to battle, to victory or death. And then rushed after the fiery nutcracker, who ventured the dangerous leap down from the upper shelf. Ah, it was easy enough for them to perform this feat, for beside the fine garments of thick cloth and silk which they wore, the inside of their bodies were made of cotton and tow, so that they came down plump like bags of wool. But poor Nutcracker had certainly broken his arms or his legs, for remember, it was almost two feet from the shelf where he stood to the floor, and his body was as brittle as if it had been cut out of linden wood. Yes, Nutcracker would certainly have broken his arms or his legs, if, at the moment when he leaped, Miss Clara had not sprung quickly from the sofa and caught the hero with his drawn sword in her soft arms. Ah, thou dear good Clara! sobbed Maria. How I have wronged thee! Thou didst certainly resign thy bed willingly to little Nutcracker. But Miss Clara now spoke as she softly pressed the young hero to her silken bosom. You will not, O oh my lord, sick and wounded as you are, share the dangers of the fight. 
see how your brave vassals assemble themselves, eager for the affray and certain of conquest. Scaramouche, Harlequin, chimney sweepers, guitar players, drummer are already drawn up below, and the china figures on the shelf stir and move strangely. Will you not, O oh my lord, repose upon the sofa or from my arms look down upon your victory? Thus spoke Clara, but Nutcracker demeaned himself very ungraciously, for he kicked and struggled so violently with his legs that Clara was obliged to set him quickly down upon the floor. He then, however, dropped gracefully upon one knee and said, Fair lady, the recollection of thy favour and condescension will go with me into the battle and the strife. Clara then stooped, so low that she could take him by the arm, raised him gently from his knees, took off her bespangled girdle, and was about to throw it across his neck, but little Nutcracker stepped two paces backward, laid his hand upon his breast, and said very earnestly, Not so, fair lady, lavish not thy favours thus upon me, for... He stopped, sighed heavily, tore off the ribbon which Maria had bound about his shoulders, pressed it to his lips, hung it across him like a scarf, and then boldly flourishing his bright little blade, leaped like a bird over the edge of the glass case upon the floor. You understand, my kind and good readers and listeners, that Nutcracker, even before he had thus come to life, had felt very sensibly the kindness and love which Maria had shown towards him. And it was because he had become so partial to her that he would not receive and wear the girdle of Miss Clara, although it shone and sparkled so brightly. The true and faithful Nutcracker preferred to wear Maria's simple ribbon. But what will now happen? As soon as Nutcracker had leaped out, the squeaking and whistling was heard again. Ah, it is under the large table that the hateful mice have concealed their countless bands, and high above them all towers the dreadful mouse with seven heads. What will now happen? End of chapter four. The Battle Beat the march, true vassal drummer, screamed Nutcracker very loudly, and immediately the drummer began to rattle and to roll upon his drum, so skilfully that the windows of the glass case trembled and hummed again. Now it rustled and clattered therein, and Maria perceived that the covers of the little boxes in which Fred's army were quartered were bursting open, and now the soldiers leaped out, and then down again upon the lowest shelf where they drew up in fine array. Nutcracker ran up and down, speaking inspiring words to the troops. Let no dog of a trumpeter blow or stir, he cried angrily, for he was afraid he should not be heard, and then turned quickly to Harlequin, who had grown a little pale and chattered with his long chin. General, he said earnestly, I know your courage and your experience. There is need now for a quick eye and skill to seize the proper moment. I entrust to your command all the cavalry and artillery. You do not need a horse, for you have very long legs and can gallop yourself tolerably well. I look to see you do your duty. Thereupon Harlequin, put his long, thin fingers to his mouth and crowed so piercingly that it sounded as if a hundred shrill trumpets were blown merrily. Then it stirred again in the glass case, a neighing and a whinnying and a stamping were heard, and see, Fred's cuirassiers and dragoons, but above all his new splendid hussars, marched out and halted close by the case. Regiment after regiment now defiled before Nutcracker, with flying colours and warlike music, and ranged themselves in long rows across the floor of the chamber. Before them went Fred's cannon rattling along, 
surrounded by the cannoneers, and soon, boom, boom, it went, and Maria could see how the mice suffered by the fire, how the sugar plums plunged into their dark, heavy mass, covering them with white powder and throwing them more than once into shameful disorder. But the greatest damage was done them by a heavy battery that was mounted upon Mamma's footstool, which pum, pum, kept up a steady fire of caraway seeds against the enemy, by which a great many of them fell. The mice, notwithstanding, came nearer and nearer, and at last mastered some of the cannon. But then it went prr, prr, and Maria could scarcely see what now happened for the smoke and dust. This, however, was certain, that each corps fought with the greatest animosity, and the victory was for a long time doubtful. The mice kept deploying more and more forces, and the little silver shot, which they fired very skilfully, struck now even into the glass case. Clara and Trutchen ran around in despair. "'Must I die in the blossom of youth?' said Clara. "'Have I so well preserved myself for this?' To perish here in these walls, cried Trutchen. Then they fell about each other's necks and screamed so terribly that they could be heard above the mad tumult of the battle. Of the scene that now presented itself, you can have no idea, good reader. It went prr, prr, puff, piff, clitter, clatter, boom, baroom, bomb, baroom, bomb, in the wildest confusion while the mouse king and mice squeaked and screamed, and now and then the mighty voice of Nutcracker was heard as he gave the necessary orders, and he was seen striding along through the battalions in the hottest of the fire. Harlequin had made some splendid charges with his cavalry and covered himself with honour, but Fred's hussars were battered by the enemy's artillery with odious offensive balls, which made dreadful spots in their red jackets, for which reason they would not move forward. Harlequin ordered them to draw off to the left, and in the enthusiasm of command, headed the movement himself, and the cuirassiers and dragoons followed. That is, they all drew off to the left and galloped home. By this step, the battery upon the footstool was exposed to great danger, and it was not long before a strong body of very ugly mice pushed on with such determined bravery that the footstool, cannons, cannoneers and all, were overthrown by their headlong charge. Nutcracker seemed a little disturbed at this, and gave orders that the right wing should make a retreating movement. You know very well, O oh my military reader Frederick, that to make such a movement is almost the same thing as to run away, and you are now grieving with me at the disaster which impends over the army of Maria's darling Nutcracker. But turn your eyes from this scene and view the left wing, where all is still in good order, and where there is yet great hope, both for the general and the army. During the hottest of the fight, Large masses of mice cavalry have debouched softly from under the settee, and amid loud and hideous squeaking, had thrown themselves with fury upon the left wing. But what an obstinate resistance did they meet with there! Slowly, as the difficult nature of the ground required, for the edge of the glass case had to be traversed, the china figures had advanced, headed by two Chinese emperors, and formed themselves into a hollow square. These brave, motley, but noble troops, which were composed of gardeners, Tyrolese, Bonzes, Friseurs, Merry Andrews, Cupids, Lions, Tigers, Peacocks and Apes, fought with coolness, courage and determination. By their Spartan bravery, this battalion of picked men would have wrested the victory from the foe, had not a bold major rushed madly from the enemy's ranks and bitten off the head of one of the Chinese emperors, who in falling dashed to the ground two bonzes and a cupid. Through this gap, the enemy penetrated into the square, and in a few moments, the whole battalion was torn to pieces. 
their brave resistance therefore was of no avail to nutcracker's army which once having begun to retreat retired farther and farther and at every step with diminished numbers until the unfortunate nutcracker halted with a little band close before the glass case let the reserve advance harlequin scaramouche drummer where are you thus cried nutcracker in hopes of new troops which should deploy out of the glass case and there actually came forth a few brown men and women made of sweet thorn with golden faces and caps and helmets but they fought around so awkwardly that they did not hit one of the enemy and at last knocked the cap off their own general's head the enemy's chasseurs too bit off their legs before long so that they tumbled over and carried with them to the ground some of the nutcracker's best officers nutcracker now completely surrounded by the foe was in the greatest peril he tried to leap over the edge into the glass case but found his legs too short clara and trutchen lay each in a deep swoon they could not help him hussar's dragoons sprang merrily by him into safe quarters and in wild despair he cried a horse a horse a kingdom for a horse at this moment two of the enemy's tigrailleurs seized him by his wooden mantle and the mouse king squeaking from his seven throats leaped in triumph towards him Maria could no longer control herself. Oh, my poor nutcracker, she cried, sobbing, and without being exactly conscious of what she did, grasped her left shoe and threw it with all her strength into the thickest of the mice, straight at their king. In an instant, all seemed scattered and dispersed, but Maria felt in her left arm a still sharper pain than before and sank in a swoon to the floor. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Nutcracker and Mouse King by E. T. A. Hoffman This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sickness When Maria woke out of her deep and death-like slumber, she found herself lying in her own bed, with the sun shining bright and sparkling through the ice-covered windows into the chamber. Close beside her sat a stranger, whom she soon recognised, however, as the surgeon Wendelstern. He said softly, She is awake. Her mother then came to the bedside and gazed upon her with anxious and inquiring looks. Ah, dear mother, lisped little Maria, are all the hateful mice gone, and is the good nutcracker safe? Do not talk such foolish stuff, replied her mother. What have the mice to do with nutcracker? You naughty child, you have caused us a great deal of anxiety. But so it always is when children are disobedient and do not mind their parents. You played last night with your dolls until it was very late. You became sleepy, probably, and a stray mouse may have jumped out and frightened you. At all events, you broke a pane of glass with your elbow and cut your arm so severely that neighbour Wendelstern, who has just taken the piece of glass out of the wound, declares that it came very near cutting a vein, in which case you might have had a stiff arm all your life, or perhaps have bled to death. It was fortunate that I woke about midnight, and not finding you in your bed, got up and went into the sitting-room. There you lay in a swoon upon the floor, close by the glass case, the blood flowing in a stream. I almost fainted away myself at the sight. There you lay and scattered around were many of Frederick's leaden soldiers, broken china figures, gingerbread men and women, and other playthings, and not far off your left shoe. Ah, dear, dear mother! exclaimed Maria, interrupting her. Those were the traces of that dreadful battle between the puppets and the mice, and what frightened me so was the danger of poor Nutcracker when the mice were going to take him prisoner. Then I threw my shoe at the mice, and after that I don't know what happened. 
Surgeon Wendelstern here made a sign to the mother, and she said very softly to Maria, Well, never mind about it, my dear child. The mice are all gone, and little Nutcracker stands safe and sound in the glass case. Dr. Stahlbaum now entered the chamber and spoke for a while with Surgeon Wendelstern. Then he felt Maria's pulse, and she could hear very plainly that he said something about a fever. She was obliged to remain in bed and take physic, and so it continued for some days, although, except a slight pain in her arm, she felt quite well and comfortable. She knew little Nutcracker had escaped safe from the battle, and it seemed to her that she sometimes heard his voice quite plainly, as if in a dream, saying mournfully, Maria, dearest lady, what thanks do I not owe you? But you can do still more for me. Maria tried to think what it could be, but in vain, nothing occurred to her. She could not play very well on account of the wound in her arm, and when she tried to read a book or look at her picture books, a strange glare came across her eyes, so that she was obliged to desist. The time during the day always seemed very long to her, and she waited impatiently for evening, as her mother then usually seated herself by her bedside and read or related some pretty story to her. One evening she had just finished the wonderful history of Prince Fakardin, when the door opened, and Godfather Drosselmeyer entered, saying, I must see now for myself how it goes with the sick and wounded Maria. As soon as Maria saw Godfather Drosselmeyer in his brown coat, the image of that night in which Nutcracker lost the battle against the mice returned vividly to her mind and she cried out involuntarily. Oh, Godfather Drosselmeyer, you have been very naughty. I saw you as you sat upon the clock and covered it with your wings, so that it should not strike loud to scare away the mice. I heard how you called out to the Mouse King. Why did you not come to help us, me and the poor Nutcracker? It is all your fault, naughty Godfather Drosselmeyer, that I must lie here sick in bed. Her mother was quite frightened at this and said, What is the matter with you, dear Maria? But Godfather Drosselmeyer made very strange faces and said in a grating, monotonous tone, Pendulum must whir, 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 this way, that way, clock will strike, tired of ticking all the day. Softly, whir, 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 strike, cling, clang, strike, clang, cling, bing, and bang, and bang, and bing, twill scare away the mouse king. Then owl in swift flight comes at dead of night, pendulum must whir, whir, clock will strike. Cling, clang, this way, that way, tired of ticking all the day. Bing, bang, a mouse king scare away. Whir, whir, prr, prr. Maria stared at Godfather Drosselmeyer, for he did not look at all as he usually did, but appeared much uglier and he moved his right arm backward and forward, like a puppet pulled by wires. She would have been afraid of him if her mother had not been present, and if Fred had not slipped in, in the meanwhile, and interrupted him with loud laughter. Ha ha, Godfather Drosselmeyer, cried Fred. You are today too droll again. You act just like my harlequin that I threw into the lumber room long ago. But their mother was very serious and said, Dear counsellor, this is very strange sport. What do you really mean by it? Gracious me, replied Drosselmeyer, laughing. Have you forgotten then my pretty watchmaker's song? I always sing it to such patience as Maria. 
With this he drew his chair close to her bed and said, Do not be angry that I did not pick out the Mouse King's fourteen eyes. That could not be. But instead, I have in store for you a very agreeable surprise. The counsellor, with these words, put his hand in his pocket, drew something out slowly, and behold, it was Nutcracker with his lost teeth nicely fastened in, and his lame chin well set and sound. Maria cried aloud with joy, while her mother smiled and said, You see now, Maria, that Godfather Drosselmeyer meant well by your little Nutcracker. But still... You must confess, Maria, said the counsellor, that Nutcracker's figure is none of the finest, neither can his face be called exactly handsome. How this ugliness came to be hereditary in the family, I will now relate to you, if you will listen. Or perhaps you know already the story of the Princess Pearlypat and the Lady Mouserings, and the skilful watchmaker. Look here, Godfather Drosselmeyer, interrupted Fred. Nutcracker's teeth you have fastened in very well, and his chin is no longer lame and rickety. But why has he no sword? Why have you not put on his sword? Ah, replied the counsellor angrily, you must always meddle and make, you rogue. What is Nutcracker's sword to me? I have cured his wounds, and he may find a sword for himself as he can. That's true said fred he is a brave fellow and will know how to get one tell me then maria continued the counsellor have you heard the story of the princess pearlypat i hope dear counsellor said the mother that your story will not be frightful as those that you narrate usually are by no means dearest madam replied drosselmeyer on the contrary what i have this time the honour to relate is droll and merry. Begin, begin then, dear godfather, cried the children, and the counsellor began as follows. End of chapter six. Chapter seven of Nutcracker and Mouse King by E. T. A. Hoffman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Story of the Hard Nut Pearly Pat's mother was the wife of a king, and therefore a queen, and Pearly Pat, straightway at the moment of her birth, a true princess. The king was beside himself with joy when he saw his beautiful daughter as she lay in the cradle. He shouted aloud, danced, jumped about upon one leg, and cried again and again, Ha ha! Was there ever anything seen more beautiful than my little pearly pat? Thereupon, all the ministers, generals, presidents, and staff officers jumped about upon one leg like the king, and cried aloud, No, never! And it was so, in truth, for as long as the world has been standing, a lovelier child was never born than this very princess pearly pat. Her little face seemed made of lilies and roses, delicate white and red. Her eyes were of living sparkling azure, and it was charming to see how her little locks curled in bright golden ringlets. Besides this, Pearly Pat had brought into the world two rows of little pearly teeth, with which two hours after her birth, she bit the High Chancellor's finger as he was examining her features too closely, so that he screamed out, Oh, Gemini! Others assert that he screamed out, Oh, Cricky! But on this point, authorities are at the present day divided. Well, little Pearly Pat bit the High Chancellor's finger, and the enraptured land knew now that some sense dwelt in Pearly Pat's beautiful body. As has been said, all were delighted. The Queen alone was very anxious and uneasy, and no one knew wherefore. 
but everybody remarked with surprise the care with which she watched Pearly Pat's cradle. Besides that, the doors were guarded by soldiers, and not counting the two nurses, who always remained close by the cradle, six maids night after night sat in the room to watch. But what seemed very foolish, and no one could understand the meaning of it, was this. Each of these six maids must have a cat upon her lap, and stroke it the whole night through, and thus keep it continually purring. It is impossible that you, dear children, can guess why Pearly Pat's mother made all these arrangements, but I know, and will straightway tell you. It happened that once upon a time many great kings and fine princes were assembled at the court of Pearly Pat's father, on which occasion much splendour was displayed. The theatres were crowded, balls were given, and tournaments held almost every day. The king, in order to show plainly that he was in no want of gold and silver, was resolved to take a good handful out of his royal treasury and expend it in a suitable manner. Therefore, as soon as he had been privately informed by the overseer of the kitchen that the court astronomer had predicted the right time for killing, he ordered a great feast of sausages, leaped into his carriage and went himself to invite the assembled kings and princes to take a little soup with him in order to enjoy the agreeable surprise which he had prepared for them. Upon his return, he said very affectionately to the queen, You know, my dear, how extremely fond I am of sausages. The queen knew at once what he meant by that, and it was this, that she should take upon herself, as she had often done before, the useful occupation of making sausages. The Lord Treasurer must straightway bring to the kitchen the great golden sausage kettle and the silver chopping knives and stew pans. A large fire of sandalwood was made, the queen put on her damask apron, and soon the sweet smell of the sausage meat began to steam up out of the kettle. The agreeable odour penetrated even to the royal council chamber, and the king, seized with a sudden transport, could no longer restrain himself. With your permission, my lords, he cried, and leaped up, ran as fast as he could into the kitchen, embraced the queen, stirred a little with his golden scepter in the kettle, and then his emotion being quieted, returned calmly to the council. The important moment had now arrived when the fat was to be chopped into little pieces and browned gently in the silver stew pans. The maids of honour now retired, for the queen, out of true devotion and reverence for her royal spouse, wished to perform this duty alone. But just as the fat began to fry, a small, whimpering, whispering voice was heard. Give me a little of the fat, sister. I should like my part of the feast. I too am a queen. Give me a little of the fat. The queen knew very well that it was Lady Mouserings who said this. Lady Mouserings had lived these many years in the king's palace. She maintained that she was related to the royal family and that she was herself a queen in the kingdom of Mausalia, for which reason she held a great court under the hearth. The queen was a kind and benevolent lady, and although she was not exactly willing to acknowledge Lady Mouserings as a true queen and sister, yet she was very ready to allow her a little banquet on this great holiday. She answered, therefore, Come out then, Lady Mouserings, you are welcome to a little of the fat. Upon this, Lady Mouserings leaped out very quickly and merrily, jumped upon the hearth and seized, with her dainty little paws, one piece of fat after the other as the queen reached it to her. 
but now all the cousins and aunts of the Lady Mouse Rings came running out, besides her seven sons, rude and forward rogues, who all fell at once upon the fat, and the terrified queen could not drive them away. But as good fortune would have it, the chief maid of honour came in at this moment, and chased away the intruding guests, so that a little of the fat was left. The king's mathematician being summoned demonstrated very clearly that there was enough remaining to season all the sausages, if distributed with the nicest judgment and skill. Drums and trumpets were now heard without, and all the invited potentates and princes, some on white palfreys, some in crystal carriages, came in splendid apparel to the sausage feast. The king received them kindly and graciously, and then adorned with crown and scepter, as became the monarch of the land, seated himself at the head of the table. Already in the first course, that of the sausage balls, it was observed that he grew pale and paler, raised his eyes to heaven, gentle sighs escaped from his bosom, and he seemed to undergo great inward suffering. But in the second course, which consisted of the long sausages, he sank back upon his throne, sobbing and moaning, held both hands to his face, and at last wept and groaned aloud. All sprang up from the table. The royal physician tried in vain to feel the pulse of the unhappy monarch. A deep-seated, unknown torture appeared to agitate him. At last, after much anxiety, and after the application of some very strong remedies, the king seemed to come a little to himself, and stammered out scarce audibly the words, Too little fat. Then the queen threw herself in despair at his feet, and sobbed out, Oh, my poor unhappy royal husband, alas, how great must be the suffering which you endure. But see the guilty one at your feet, punish, punish her without mercy. Alas, Lady Mouserings with her seven sons and aunts and cousins have eaten up the fat and... With these words she fell right over backwards in a swoon. Then the king, full of rage leaped up and cried out, Chief Maid of Honour, how happened that? The Chief Maid of Honour told the story as much as she knew of it, and the king resolved to take vengeance upon Lady Mouserings and her family for having eaten up the fat of his sausages. The Privy Council was called, and it was resolved to summon Lady Mouserings to trial and confiscate all her estates. But as the king was of opinion that in the meanwhile she might eat up more of his sausage fat, the affair was placed at last in the hands of the royal watchmaker and mechanist. This man, whose name was the same as mine, to wit, Christian Elias Drosselmeyer, engaged, by means of a very singular and deep political scheme, to drive Lady Mouserings and her family from the palace forever. He invented, therefore, several curious little machines, in which a piece of toasted fat was fastened to a thread, and these Drosselmeyer placed around Lady Mouserings' dwelling. Lady Mouserings was much too wise not to see through Drosselmeyer's craft, but all her warnings, all her entreaties were of no avail. Every one of her seven sons, and many of her cousins and aunts, went into Drosselmeyer's machines, and, as they tried to snap away the fat, were caught by an iron grating, which fell suddenly down behind them, and were afterwards miserably slaughtered in the kitchen. Lady Mouserings, with the little remnant of her family, forsook the dreadful place. Grief, despair, revenge filled her bosom. The court revelled in joy at this event, but the queen 
was very anxious, for she knew the disposition of Lady Mouserings, and was very sure that she would not suffer the death of her sons to go unavenged. In fact, Lady Mouserings appeared one day when the Queen was in the kitchen, preparing a harslet hash for her royal husband, a dish of which he was very fond, and said, my sons my cousins and aunts are destroyed take care queen that mouse queen does not bite thy little princess in two take good care with this she disappeared and was not seen again but the queen was so frightened that she let the hash fall into the fire and thus a second time lady mousering spoiled a favourite dish for the king at which he was very angry. But this, dear children, said Drosselmeyer, is enough for tonight, the rest at another time. Maria, who had her own thoughts about this story, begged Godfather Drosselmeyer very hard to go on, but she could not prevail upon him. He rose, saying, Too much at once is bad for the health, the rest tomorrow. As the counsellor was just stepping out of the room, Fred called out, Tell me, Godfather Drosselmeyer, is it then really true that you invented mouse traps? How can you ask such a silly question? said his mother. But the counsellor smiled mysteriously and said in an undertone, Am I a skilful watchmaker? and yet not able to invent a mouse trap end of chapter 7